Well, hello, ICS Village. I'm coming to you live from sunny Amsterdam. And today I'm going to be talking about uh, critical infrastructure and a presentation that I gave recently at the United Nations after an invitation at the uh, United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research. So I hope you enjoy it. Um, if you don't know who I am, that's fine. I'm uh, certainly not a household name, um, but uh, my name is Chris Trebecca, and I am the CEO of two companies, one in the Netherlands, one in the UK, dealing with cyber warfare and ICS, IoT, and IT uh, proactive security. I'm also a distinguished non-resident fellow at the Middle East Institute, and uh, previous to all of this, I used to head the Information Protection Group for Aramco and I was a air crew member and was in space command dealing with command and control systems. Uh, one might say I'm also a bit of a reformed hacker um, or at least now a reformed unethical hacker uh, because I come from it from a slightly different point of view where I started as a kid being a uh, quote unquote black hat hacker uh, and got busted at the age of 12 doing very, very naughty things. So why is this uh, particular talk and this topic important? Well, one of the reasons is we now live in this wonderful digital world. We're able to have DEF CON and the ICS Village remotely, and we depend absolutely on technology. And if we want uh, our modern world to continue, we have to deal with the simple fact that uh, hopefully our technology will not be used to kill us. So the United Nations has been involved a little bit late in the game and uh, they are very concerned about member states and their responsibilities securing the ICT assets within their own borders. So in 2015, I did say they were a little late, a group of governmental experts published a report, Report H, uh, that stated four main facts that every member state is supposed to secure its own country's cyberspace. That includes IT, IoT, and ICS security. In addition to that, every single member state should have a computer emergency response team. Fantastic. Uh, and it also with that, uh, if there is a country where an attack is coming from and then transiting through, that uh, if you are a transit uh, country, say like uh, something coming through the Netherlands, uh, aiming at Austria or the United States, then that transit country and their telecoms uh, should be able to provide aid. And also any member state that's under major attack should uh, be able to exchange uh, information on the incident and also uh, technology. And if at all possible, additional uh, subject matter experts like CERT teams to assist in a major attack. Now, this sounds all wonderful, uh, lovely juggly. And at the UN, uh, the majority of member states did agree to this particular report and thought that these things were very, very important to have. However, uh, at the UN level, at this global scale, uh, lots of government experts um, don't actually realize what's really going down on the ground. So this is one of my favorite quotes. It is never underestimate how dependent you are on your information technology and systems. It's become like oxygen. You think you can live without it, but you can't. And this was a quote from the CEO of Saudi Aramco after the 2012 Shamoon attacks. And what you're seeing here is a picture of one of the events uh, that happened after the attack where uh, there were miles and miles of gasoline trucks that could no longer be loaded up uh, because the uh, industrial IoT system in between uh, was no longer functioning, nor were the payment systems. Now, Saudi Aramco experienced the world's worst cyber warfare attack. It isn't spoken about too much because I'm currently the only person authorized uh, to actually discuss it. Uh, in about two hours, 85% of their IT systems were lost. And when I say IT systems, this is the VoIP phone, this is uh, the payment systems, this is the HR data, uh, some of the backups were wiped, uh, some of the firewalls were affected, and there were two production plants were actually affected. 
And unfortunately, Ramco was unprepared. They believed, you know what, barely anybody knows about us unless you're in the oil and gas industry. So why would we ever be a target? Well, unfortunately for them, around the same time, Arab Spring was going on and uh, Stuxnet had recently occurred. And Saudi Arabia and uh, Iran are not very good friends. And um, because of this lack of understanding, their systems, both on the IT side, IoT side, and ICS side, were not very uh, prepared or secure at all. Now, uh, in addition to this, the attack uh, affected countrywide internet connectivity, taking out two of the three mobile providers because they actually suffered the internet connection. And uh, Aramco uh, provided internet connectivity for emergency services, hospitals, schools, police stations, universities, and you see where I'm going with this, it was not a very nice picture. Uh, 14 days after the initial attack, Qatar's national oil company, Razgas, a joint venture between Qatar and ExxonMobil, was hit with a different variant. Uh, the Shmoon variant for Saudi Aramco had a burning American flag. Uh, the Qatar one did not. And uh, what we estimated after the attack, if the two companies had actually fallen and could not restore themselves as quickly as possible, we estimated that a barrel of oil could hit as high as $450 per barrel. And uh, if that had happened, uh, it would have caused a domino chain of global economic and supply chain damage. Uh, we see COVID right now where it's causing a lot of issues, um, but imagine if nobody could purchase oil. Uh, no cargo ships could purchase oil because it would be too expensive. You see where I'm going with this. We teetered precariously on the edge of a modern age, uh, Bronze Age collapse due to the cyber malicious attack. The reason why I know about this attack in depth was because I was the person requested to help recover international business operations and establish their mature digital security and cyber threat intelligence. So one of the things we have to understand is the vast majority of critical infrastructure is actually privately owned. And uh, there are limitations to how much a state can regulate, legislate, and ultimately dictate to the private sector. Uh, there are major costs associated with going, hey, guess what? You got this legacy stuff. It's not really up to snuff. So you're just going to have to replace it. So then comes into the question, what should water actually cost versus uh, a beautifully near risk-free risk -free ICS system? And now that we're in the middle of the pandemic, unfortunately, our hospital is going to have to choose between securing their systems, which also includes a lot of medical IoT devices, or are they going to um, have to go ventilator, secure ICT? And I think all of us right now uh, watching this, we would kind of like those ventilators. Now, when it comes to establishing a computer emergency response team, this is a fantastic step. Um, however, we have to understand that uh, a CERT team is a very reactive team. They are constantly putting out fires. And usually these teams are not very big. Um, what happens as well is they have to do putting out fires, right, uh, advisements to constituents, advisements to governments. They're doing a whole bunch of stuff and investigations and give training and especially give training to critical infrastructure. Uh, they don't have a lot of time to do a lot of anything, uh, but yet they're expected to do basically everything. We also have to understand that a lot of uh, computer emergency response teams are not actually capable of doing all of the services that are expected of them or are not actually mature enough to provide the majority of services. There are still uh, CERT teams uh, in various countries that don't even use encryption on their website. And not all CERTs uh, actually take vulnerability disclosure. I provided feedback for a person who works for a German think tank who's writing a paper right now for the German government. And one of the things she noted was the fact that uh, here I live in the European Union and we have something called CERT EU. And she was very puzzled over the fact that nowhere on their website could you find a link or information on how to actually disclose vulnerability information. And this is a CERT that um, in 
essence would provide a uh, response for 513 million people. So there are a lot of limitations with certs. Now, one of the things that I proposed to the United Nations was certs, fantastic. I think that is step one to uh, really taking a look at how member states should really you know, secure their cyberspace. But at the same time, I propose to them uh, a SEPT, if one might uh, pronounce it that way, but a computer emergency prevention team. And I truly believe that member states should have these. Uh, so a team that actively looks for any sort of issue for high probability of compromise to systems, whether that's IT, IT, and ICS that are exposed to the internet, uh, look at the supply chain issues, which may allow for exposure, and uh, be that kind of like fire alarm and warning system before the fire actually bursts into flames and has to be put out. In addition to this, they can also take on the role of the advisement, especially in critical infrastructure, allowing the computer emergency response teams to actually put out the fires when they need to. So I'm uh, a big believer in proactive security. And uh, currently I am the subject matter expert for part of the European Union where we're building the world's first exclusively proactive security team uh, where we are looking for uh, high probability of compromised systems and detecting uh, compromise as quickly as possible and starting the incident response portion of locking down a system and and determining what the major risks are before the CERT team comes in for the incident, the rest of the incident portion. So we live in this wonderful connected world and I'm gonna give you a new term and a hashtag you're free to use, uh, BYOH, bring your own house. Uh, I happen to be in my home, uh, but uh, when we connect up to uh, power plants or any sort of production or industrial IoT, or even our, our workplace, uh, which might just be regular IT systems. Um, what has happened in this wonderful pandemic, not wonderful at all, is the fact that uh, the employees were sent home, and this also includes technicians and engineers, and they're like, hey, do your job from home. Okay, great. So I share this network with perhaps my kids, perhaps my partner, perhaps I'm stealing the neighbor's Wi-Fi, who knows? And uh, their home network is now considered perimeter security uh, in many ways. Now, I'm fortunate to have uh, my own commercial grade firewall that cost me about 2,500 euro, but most companies are not going to roll that out uh, for their employees. So uh, perimeter security is now your front door. And when we take a look at how uh, engineers and operators are trying to stay connected, we are going into a very kind of scary area right now uh, because one of the things I did uh, also preparing for my Red Team Village talk was to do a, a massive scan uh, across the internet and try to find uh, some easily found exposed control systems, looking at uh, ICS, uh, industrial IoT. And unfortunately, I found way too many systems. As you can see, I have this wonderful table that says, please hack me. The reason for that is a lot of these systems, um, either they don't have very much in the way of uh, security, like uh, the Modbus protocol, you have to be very careful with that one. Or even if they've got a more modern um, control system uh, protocol, it doesn't necessarily mean they're on the newest and greatest firmware or the fact that a lot of these things now are really industrial IoT products. And they've got these wonderful things called web servers. And I like to say, if it looks like a web server, hack it like a web server. And so just because the protocols uh, might be wonderfully put together for say Siemens S7, if it's got a web server login exposed to the internet and <clears throat> it hasn't really been tested for security, then you know, release the cross-site scripting and a bevy of other different types of attacks. So 
one of the problems we have is um, hacking. And when I say hacking, I don't just mean uh, my 10 year old self or uh, some of the people who uh, deal with uh, offensive security and find uh, certain vulnerabilities. We also have to consider the fact that uh, a lot of nation states are involved. Uh, and when I say a lot, uh, one of my favorites is actually um, Ethiopia has a full fledged offensive security team that is authorized to do various hacks because they've been at war uh, and are involved in various skirmishes with Antrea. So um, if Ethiopia has something, lots of other countries have this particular capability. Uh, we also have to take a look at geopolitics and things that are going on. Um, I was uh, chit-chatting with Bryson Bort uh, before we started, and I'm currently doing research into cyber guerrilla warfare between Azerbaijan and Armenia, where the Armenian um, nuclear powder plant um, is actually under threat because Azerbaijan has publicly stated that they want to blow it up. And uh, I don't think that's good for anyone, especially since I live in Europe and I don't want to like another Chernobyl and I don't want cancer. So we have to take uh, the security devices, uh, the way they're put together, the configuration, if they're exposed or not, think about geopolitics, but then also think about the fact that not everybody is a friend. So if there's a major incident between several countries, even transit countries, uh, some countries won't necessarily help others. And even if they do help others, they don't necessarily phrase what they need in um, a proper question so that another country can give proper aid. And uh, one of the other things that we have to think about is before something major happens, uh, groups actually need to start talking to each other because you don't just pick up the phone to a random country and go, hey, I need this stuff. And they're like, I don't even know you. I've never met you. Uh, and trust goes a long way, both with formal and informal networks. And uh, one of the previous speakers uh, had mentioned he was from academia and uh, academia is fantastic and they can think out of the box in certain ways, but uh, unfortunately, not every person uh, who's in academia who's studying this topic necessarily has that hacker mentality. And uh, currently there is not enough involvement from the tech community. So, We've got some things uh, that are fantastic that we can use uh, at the United Nations, and these are existing treaties. Now, whilst I was giving my presentation, uh, one of the other presenters had brought up previous to me that perhaps we need to create this brand new treaty to tackle these issues. And my response was, guess what? We have stuff that we can use. We can expand on existing conventions but if we're going to be doing a new treaty, it's going to take years and years and years uh, if it even gets a certain level of consensus from other member states inside the United Nations. And incidents don't wait years and years. Incidents want attention now and they need it now. So we can use the Budapest Convention. There's also existing counterterrorism uh, legislation and relationships between countries. They also can be utilized if there's a major attack that is happening, uh, going through countries or hitting a particular country's critical infrastructure. So uh, when it deals to comes to preparation, one of the things that we have to remember is uh, practice, 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 right? And I think we've heard this at uh, many different discussions, whether it's critical infrastructure or uh, other areas. And the way that you get very good at something is to practice it. And obviously not every incident is going to be exactly the same because everyone is, un everyone is uh, unique and different. But when we talk about exercises, they're still kind of lacking, especially at the UN level for different things like this. Now, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to work with uh, the European Center for Foreign Relations on building um, NATO and EU member exercises for diplomats and ministers. And I was the only uh, tech person who was a subject matter expert who was not an academic. Uh, and I noticed that this was really, really lacking. 
um, because we need to get uh, CERT people involved in this uh, to do a good exercise. Um, a SEPT team, uh, team members, as well as uh, ministerial advisors, because a minister and an, an ambassador do not make decisions all by themselves, they have advisors. Uh, we also have to involve the public and private sector, obviously grab some academics uh, as well, because they can share a lot of different research, uh, but also consider us, a lot of the people who are watching this talk right now, uh, in the tech community and subject matter experts who have actually dealt with some of these things. Uh, reformed, nice uh, hackers, so to speak, uh, who can think in a way uh, that they can misuse systems and even information that nobody else can really think about uh, within the uh, other groups. So one of the major things that I proposed to the United Nations was we need to get security researchers involved. Uh, one of the biggest reasons is when you get the tech community involved, I'll give you a good for instance, there is a CTI league, which was set up of subject matter expert tech community folks, and they volunteer to uh, protect hospitals and medical personnel and medical devices. And they work extremely quickly. They also interface with computer emergency response teams, Europol and other law enforcement, so that uh, hospitals have some sort of um, advantage in this game. Uh, a few months ago, I was contacted by a particular EU government because 15 of their hospitals went down on a Friday night because it was a cyber attack. And that particular country came out publicly saying, uh, this country who did these attacks, stop attacking our hospitals. But uh, defending and realizing that there are uh, some exploitable systems out there, if you've got the tech community involved, they can go ahead and interface like that, like the snap of your fingers. Um, unfortunately, when you're dealing with diplomats and countries on that much higher level, those formal networks are kind of slow. Um, now, another thing that I brought up to the United Nations is the fact that the majority of ICT vulnerabilities, both IT, IT, ICS areas, they're still discovered by good hackers like us attending DEF CON safe mode. And uh, this is fantastic because a lot of us do this, uh, maybe for a t-shirt and some stickers, sometimes a bug bounty, but really because we want these systems protected so we can use them when we say we have to go to a hospital. And uh, unfortunately, we still face a lot of legal barriers. Um, as I've mentioned before, not all certs actually will take vulnerability disclosures. And sometimes if you contact a company or a power plant or a hospital or whatever, uh, they might have the reaction of, who the heck are you? Are you trying to extort us for money? Um, are you some sort of criminal? So there's some legal barriers. And sometimes you have to deal with very strange laws. Like in the Netherlands, you're not allowed to ping a computer system. That's written in our cyber law, even computer systems you own, um, which is still, kind of odd, but uh, depending on the country or the laws, um, you could actually be arrested for reporting some of these things. Uh, now, another um, issue is who to contact. Uh, here you've got this major thing and you wanna be able to contact people as quickly as possible uh, in a secure manner, but who do you contact? Using the CERT EU example, I have no idea. And neither does the person writing the paper for Germany. Um, so what we have to realize is, as we all plainly know right now, <clears throat> we live in this digital world and we are absolutely as dependent on ICT CT systems as we are to oxygen in this modern world. So my closing recommendation to the United Nations was that the UN and member states should lead the effort in establishing computer emergency prevention teams because it is much easier, cheaper, quicker to prevent a major attack against critical infrastructure than it is to try to put out a fire at one. So I have some references, which I can uh, copy and paste somehow and put into Discord or folks can take screenshots. The first one is 
the UN Group of Governmental Experts Report H from July 2015. There will be a new report coming out from uh, my presentation and other people's presentations uh, that we gave at the United Nations last year, or excuse me, last month. And also, if you want to take a look at a very, very good uh, convention that actually deals with cybercrime uh, that can be utilized for information sharing, uh, technology sharing, subject matter expert sharing, et cetera, when a major incident occurs, the Budapest uh, Convention of Cybercrime is excellent. And last but not least, uh, thank you very much, ICS Village, uh, and doing this safe mode. I know it took a lot of work and Mr. Bryson Bort for uh, inviting me to do this talk. And if you want to know more about me, I'm available on Twitter. I do take DMs, just, just no, no weird pictures, please. Uh, and also, uh, we're doing a lot of work. We have just uh, started the cyber portion of the Middle East Institute. Uh, I'm the first uh, distinguished non-resident fellow uh, and person uh, coming in as a non-resident coming into uh, the Middle East Institute uh, specifically for cyber to look at these particular issues. So that ends my presentation. And what I'll do is I will look on this Discord. Uh, and hopefully there are some questions. And there doesn't seem to be that many questions, but that's OK. Uh, do, does the ICS Village have any questions? Or I'll just dance. <laughs> I'm up and it's after midnight and I'm still here <laughs> somehow. <laughs> well, since no one has any more questions, thank you very much, everyone. Um, and hopefully the United Nations will take some of my recommendations on how to uh, secure their individual member state uh, cyberspace, um, specifically uh, critical infrastructure, a lot better in the near future.